Hi guys, I just want to say my concerns about these measures of self-isolationism and my real concerns are that in the short term there's a minority of people that will be really affected by this. People that have had long-term psychosocial problems, various mental health conditions that may or may not have been recognised and diagnosed. Um, people that have had long-term issues with anxiety, um, with depression and grief. Um, people that have had um, isolation um, through different learning difficulties, um, through neurological brain damage, um, through a variety of different things that they may have gone through in their lives. Post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Um, somebody that's been the victim of domestic abuse who finds it very difficult to cope with others and so the interactions and the social support network that they do have is something that they become much more dependent on um, to help them through. So uh, people with a variety of so many different mental health disorders that are dependent on good support structures to help them thrive will be and I'm sure are struggling to cope with the current isolation. Um, personally, my feelings are that the large majority of people will be OK and are OK. That It's probably the source of a lot of annoyance. It's a nuisance. Um, it's frustrating. It's annoying. There's boredom. Um, there's a bit of nausea. It's just sort of not knowing what to do with yourself. There's the stress and worry of that. Um, the sadness and annoyance at not seeing family members, but at least you have telephone contact and it's really only been a month or so and you're in the confines and the comforts of your own home. And so it's really not so concerning for majority of people. And I think for most people, it's probably OK. And, you know, there's plenty of other things that people can keep busy doing at home, cooking, cleaning, different art projects, um, DIY, um, making videos, watching videos. Um, there's various other things that people will engage with at home, um, getting to know the people they're living with more, hopefully not arguing with them more. Um, but um, for a minority of people that were already going through long term extreme mental health problems, this will be a critical time and a great hardship potentially for them. And all the more reason that, that they would receive as much support as they can. Now, there probably will be some people that have a continuity of some support, I would imagine. People with recognised illnesses um, that perhaps are in support homes or visited by home carers. Um, so I, I would assume that some people with severe needs are already having some support continued. Whether that support was already enough or not is probably another issue, although related um, but there's probably a much larger group who've got moderate needs that aren't necessarily receiving any officially um, given support that will have severely restricted support networks now, one in which they may have actually really depended upon. And, and I think it's that group that, particularly in the long term, may really struggle. And I, and I would think that we need to really be concerned about that. What are the long term effects on different groups of people um, with different conditions um, how what are the consequences for various people over a long period of time so much emphasis has been put on the risks of spreading the infection if we allow people to go out and socialize more if we don't restrict people's movements and okay I, at least I can understand that, at least in terms of visiting people who are chronically ill with physical long term health conditions. Um, but I would say people with long term mental health conditions limiting their support networks whilst we're going through such stress, there's perhaps such anxiety over the issues already. That could potentially be a, a huge problem. You know, we might see the consequence of that being a pandemic of mental health problems. I'm not saying that that absolutely will happen if there's long term measures, but I'm saying it's a possibility and it is something that we need to be concerned about and need to look into. And when we're weighing up possible risks in terms of mortality, in terms of how useful the measures are, that has to be absolutely considered. You know, it's all very well saying, oh, there could be risks allowing people social contact to him spreading the infection but if you are depriving people of liberty 
and depriving people of any social contact and support network, over a long period of time, you're going to find a larger group of people potentially struggling with pathological illnesses. What about people that are in domestic abuse situations at home? You know, living with people that potentially are violent towards them, that are prone to anger. You know, what about children living in those conditions, in fact? You know, what about people that depended upon those support networks? OK, for a few weeks without that, but months and months without that could be a very different thing altogether. You know, what about people with addiction issues? You know, what about people with suicidal or homicidal tendencies? So this idea of, oh, we're all OK at home. We can watch Netflix or TV programmes. We can do a bit of artwork. You know, we can watch videos. We can hang out with our housemates. You know, we can do a bit of gardening or go for walks. OK, I'm all right, Jack. But what about in the short term, a large enough amount of people, albeit a minority, that do have long term psychosocial problems and may be at severe risk of suicidal, homicidal tendencies and certainly of self-harm. What about the risk to those people? There could be hundreds. There could even be thousands of people across the country at severe risk of that. So, in fact, this idea of we're OK at home, we've got cope, we're able to cope, you know, but not everyone is. And there will be a sizable proportion of people that will be increasingly struggling as weeks go on. And the risk in the longer term, if those measures are allowed to continue to be extended for months on end, will be severe. The long term effects of depriving people of social contact are well studied, psychologically documented. I encourage people to do the research on that because my assessment would be from my own experience in mental health, from visiting various psychiatric wards over many, many years, from visiting clients deprived of much social contact in their own home, my own experience from my own problems from friends, family and clients has been that many people do depend on that social support network, however limited that is. And that depriving people of that limited contact they already had can have and does have a very detrimental effect on their well-being and ripples out and affects other people too. Right. And I would estimate that in the short term, there's a minority of people at substantial risk due to long term mental health problems if they're denied that social contact and support from others. But in the long term, there's a much larger group of people that could be potentially at risk of psychosis. Now, I had a psychiatrist years ago, very qualified. He treated hundreds of patients and his assessment just made common sense as well. You know, you don't accept something just because an expert tells you, but you assess it and see, does that sound reasonable? Does that accord with my own day to day experiences, with my own life experiences? Now, his assessment did accord with my own experiences and it was quite simple. He basically stated there were, there were three things that caused psychosis. You know, he'd witnessed countless patients that had been sectioned through a psychotic episode. And he said the three causes generally of psychotic episodes are one, a lot of stress in the person's lifestyle. It could be that they're homeless, a domestic abuse victim. Two, where there's a lack of support network to that person. And three, where that individual has not made sufficient attempts and has not worked hard enough to, to cope with those conditions to better themselves. Those are the three things. If somebody lacks um, energy, if they're not making enough effort, if they're not going out and working hard, if they're under a huge amount of stress and if they lack a good support network, those are the three criteria that will absolutely guarantee a psychotic episode. If you've got severe stress, no support network and you're not making enough effort, then, then that is... You know, now, whether someone makes effort or not, of course, comes down to their ability and their desire to do so, of course. You know, not everyone's got the same abilities. Um, all we can control is how much effort and energy we, we make to keep ourselves well. Um, we can't, you know, we can't control what support we have necessarily. We may have some influence in that to a limited extent. 
But I think as a result of that, you know, maybe it's trying to sort of not put people under severe amounts of stress and to make sure that people do have adequate support networks when we're able to. And I think it is something to sort of bear in mind myself. And of course, the other thing that we can absolutely control is making an effort ourselves to keep ourselves as well as possible, to keep ourselves stimulated, active mentally and physically engaged in a variety of exercises to help support ourselves and others as much as we can. It's easy for me to say that and doing it is a, often a different thing, of course. Um, but I have got long term concerns about the possible risks of large numbers of people. I don't want to make wild speculations about thousands of people currently at risk, tens of thousands of people in the future more at risk. You know, I don't know the numbers of that and I'm not going to sort of make wild speculations. But I do know, you know, based on my own experiences, based on the evidences from psychiatrists and indeed from other clients and sufferers of various mental health disorders, I know that long-term deprivation with lots of stress leads to an increased risk of psychotic episodes. Psychotic episodes means high levels of self-harm, possible risks of suicidal and homicidal tendencies. You know, do you really want that on an epic scale? Do you really want a pandemic of mental health disorders, of psychiatric disorders to such a huge extent? We don't have the resources to deal with the problems we've got now. Never mind some pandemic down the road that could potentially happen. Now, I'm not saying that it definitely will, but I'm saying that there are potentially risks to long-term deprivation on large numbers of people who are under lots of stress. I think it's something we all need to investigate, to look into more, and to consider when we're weighing up the risks to people's well-being and safety, that it's not just only about the infection, that actually, if you don't also consider the person, their social needs, their mental, their emotional their spiritual needs as well. You know, you have to consider everything within the whole of it. You know, otherwise, you know, if you're prepared to just turn a blind eye and say, oh, well, it's only a few, a minority of people with extreme conditions suffering at the moment. Yes, the majority of us are OK and well equipped to deal with a few months isolation. However irritating, you know, we might suffer a small amount, but it will be manageable and we'll probably get through it OK. What about the minority that maybe won't, that maybe do lack that support network already? And what about if those measures are allowed to be continually extended for months more or perhaps even longer? What about the risks then to an even larger group of people who may only have moderate problems now, but which may be exacerbated if they are continually deprived of support networks over a longer period of time? What about the risks of a pandemic of psychotic episodes in the future. Is that not something worthy of consideration? If we don't at least have the concern for a minority already struggling and going through those problems now, what about the risks to a much larger amount of people that could potentially suffer with longer term effects of deprivation and social isolation in the future? That's something that must be considered when we're weighing up the benefits and the risks and the harms of these measures, both as a short term, but all the more so as a long term potential measure. I would urge people to consider that in the overall analysis. Um, and if you look at it in terms of years, if you if you extend the length of the deprivation and the amount of restrictions, then you're only going to increase the potential pathology of the various conditions of the people. That only stands to reason. Logic alone dictates that if you denied everyone for many years any real social interaction, it's likely you would probably see the disintegration of social fabric. You know, it, it would just be, you know, like, would life even be worthwhile? Now, I, why are we considering whether this could last for years or not? We're only talking about a three week extension at the moment. OK. But it is worthwhile considering what the longer term effects could be, either for many months or even years, 
Because if you justify doing this short-term shutdown and self-isolation, then you could use those same justifications for doing it again, or for extending those for longer periods of time, or at least extending some of the restrictions. So it's worthwhile examining what kind of effect that could actually have before you commit yourself to a long-term extension of those measures. I think it's not only worthwhile doing it, I think we're all duty-bound to do it, if not for concern and compassion for those that may already be suffering, those already a minority, albeit, with extreme mental health needs, but those people that could become more pathological in the future if deprived of social contact. I think it's something that we have to concern ourselves with and have to look at, and, and I would urge other people to do that, really. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the current situation. We're currently being told, you know, well, in three weeks' time it will be reviewed and... You know, but there's no guarantee. What I'm looking to hear from the government is we want to get back to people being able to contact each other, to socialise in a manner in which they can thrive, in which they're dependent upon. We want to get back to that because we know how necessary it is for a good, fulfilling, productive lifestyle. Right, that's our goal, to get back to that as soon as possible. We also want to concern ourselves with supporting those that are going through deprivations and struggling with it. Right, those are at risk of self-harm, of suicidal or homicidal tendencies, to limit those harms that could be done to other people. That's what I want to be hearing from governments, okay? I want to be hearing, and I'm not hearing that at the moment, and that is deeply concerning, to be honest. Um, this whole thing of in three weeks time it will be reviewed and considered but there's no guarantees of anything going back to the social contact that we'd had before and what I want to hear is we want to get back to people being allowed to meet up and have gatherings that actually are a vital part of their mental, emotional, social, spiritual well-being so that they can lead good, fulfilling, healthy lifestyles. And that's our goal, to get back to that as soon as possible. And I'm not hearing that message, unfortunately, yet. And I'm also not hearing any real concern about um, those that are already, albeit a limited number, struggling with these measures and the potentially larger number that will probably struggle if there's an increase to these measures in the future.